All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, our Graham Rounds for this week. Um, we are very honored this week to have Dr. Sylvia Lucas um, giving us one of her fabulous presentations on headache. And I know in my experience here, these have been some of the best lectures for the residents and the faculty um, that, that I can remember clinically. So um, Sylvia did her MD, PhD here at the University of Washington. She then went to Cornell, where she did her residency with the likes of Plum and Posner, um, and then has came back to Seattle, was in at Swedish and other places before joining the faculty here, and has been a longtime faculty member here um, in neurology and a tremendous resource for our department um, with her specialty in headaches. So with that, I will turn it over to Sylvia. Just such a kind introduction. Thank you. Um, um, although, if you're faculty here, you're kind of a captive <laughs> to, to give talks. But um, I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is, of course, headache. And um, trying to trying to do a headache talk for audiences that have heard me before people that haven't heard me before that you might not know about headache is a little bit difficult, so bear with me if you've heard this before. Um, the slides you're going to see are from my last vacation, except it really wasn't very comfortable. Um, and I thought this was really interesting, and I didn't, and I didn't use a zoom on that, so um, it came really kind of close. <laughs> um, so, is, is this what you think when a patient walks in to see you for you know, a chronic feeling headache or is this a patient approach to a headache doctor? You might notice they're chewing something, probably getting ready to spit it out. But um, uh, I think headache for a lot of people is very difficult. And not that we want you to get in, into the mind of a headache patient, but I think in some cases you'll see that that might be what you need to do in order to really um, treat the patient. The, the, the most important thing about um, seeing a new patient coming into your office is you're going to ask yourself, is this a primary headache disorder or is this a secondary headache disorder? And I'm going to assume you have some knowledge of headache, but a primary headache disorder are so ones that are probably going to be the most common thing you see in your practices. Um, I'll show you the numbers in a couple of slides, but it's assumed that primary headache disorders are genetically acquired, for example, if one parent or side of the family has migraine, your patient at least has a 50% running chance of having it. If it's on both sides, it's about 70%. So they are defined clinically, whereas secondary headaches actually have no clinical definition. They're really thought to be headaches that are causative by something underlying them. So for example, post-traumatic headaches, uh, it's assumed that the cause is the head trauma. And once the head trauma resolves, the headache should go away. There really isn't any clinical information about the headache. It's latency information, has to occur within seven days, and the severity of the head injury information, which really doesn't do you much good when you're trying to talk about the headache. So um, migraine, in a nutshell, it's going to be a moderate to severe headache. You're going to have what we call sensitization associated with it. Sometimes you may have um, uh, scalp that's very tender, women can't wear earrings, scarves, that kind of thing. Uh, we're used to thinking of it as light and sound sensitivity. It's almost as if sensory gain has been increased. And the most important thing with that, though, is the moderate to severe headache. You're not going to find that in tension headaches. This is what people go to see their primary care physician first for. Um, and most neurologists are probably going to see chronic daily headache. Why? Um, well, a lifetime prevalence of an episodic uh, tension type headache is probably about 93%. It's way over 90%. So most people have had a headache, but as far as moderate to severe disabling headache, you're looking at 33 million people in the United States alone. Um, and this is going to be mostly a primary care headache, although sometimes the headache clinic does get, you know, doctor naive <laughs> patients, which is really so surprising. We usually see people that get more than 50% of their living time uh, spent with headache. Donald Trump, do you think headache? What do you think? That's going to 
get its own ICD-10 code soon. <laughs> right after he gets blocked from entering uh, the UK ever. Um, as far as secondary headaches go, um, use, it, it's basically the SNP characteristics, right? I mean, anything that raises the hackles on your back like that, like that bear, you know, uh, the worst headache of your life, a new headache, um, progressive headache syndrome, uh, anything that increases um, intracranial, intrathoracic pressure. Of course, goes without saying it's an abnormal neurologic exam finding that hasn't been documented before. Um, and a history of something that might metastasize to the brain. So the other thing that's not there, why would you image somebody? And sometimes the patient is so frightened that it probably saves you two or three office visits to do the imaging, especially if you're kind of on the, on the line about whether to do that. So, of course, as with anything else in neurology, I think the first thing Fred Plum ever said to the residents that was, well, anyway, I won't go into that, but 95% of the time you're going to know the diagnosis after you take the history, if you take a proper history. And uh, I think it more so, you know, with headache, it's certainly that way too. Um, so this, and, and this is a self-portrait of a patient that had my, uh, that had migraine headaches. So what, what here makes you feel good about this being a primary headache disorder? 32 years old, started to be getting headaches at age 12. So 20 year history of headache, episodic headache, you're starting to breathe a little bit easier about primary headache disorder. And also, um, if you think about what I said about in that migraine slide, severe pain, it's got a pulsatile character, um, nausea, vomiting. She's got the sensitization with scalp, light, sound, movement, all hurting. Um, stays in bed, misses two days of work a month. So um, I want to talk about treatments. And part of this is just because you may see this in the outpatient clinic, or you may be called to the emergency room to give your opinion on something and you may need to come up with a treatment protocol. Most of us feel pretty comfortable with acute treatment by now. It's been 12 years since Imitrex came out, still the gold standard for the triptan. Although I will say when the triptans go generic, we've all noticed a little bit of a longer latency of onset of effect and maybe not as efficacious, but better than Excedrin. <laughs> so establishing the diagnosis and also setting realistic goals for the patient. Even just saying, I can't cure your headaches, but, and then explaining why, um, maybe brings down sort of this tighter anxiety for people that may be experiencing terrific pain and associated symptoms. Um, Trigger recognition is sometimes helpful, and that involves education, which we all have so much time to do. But at the end of these slides, and I think these slides are available in archives, um, or I can send you screenshots of any slides you want, I have some references that you should have um, to give patients, and a lot of them are really good at, at, at educating the patient. Probably the most consistent trigger you're going to see is in women migraineurs, 60% of whom have menstrual associated headaches, headaches that always occur three days before to three days after, and they could have headaches at other times as well. The preventative treatment, the idea here is to decrease migraine frequency and intensity. Again, not a cure, but we're certainly hoping for improved quality of life with a, the triumvirate of uh, treatments. So the management issues at first visit, um, once you make your diagnosis, you're going to give a patient an initial therapy. Please use the concept of stratified care. Um, many of you have heard of this, I think. You need to match the treatment needs to the attack profile instead of using, um, you know, you start at the bottom and say, well, why don't you take a couple of ibuprofen, and if you're not better in two hours, why don't you use Imitrex, and if you're not better, call me, that kind of thing. Because if you know, like our patient, who is in bed two days a month, she has severe headaches. She's not going to, she's probably tried. In fact, most migraine people try an average of 5.6 things over the counter before they go to a doctor. So she's probably already tried that. You want to start with a triptan. But you want some more information from her as well, because a lot of people are not going to be triptan naive. 
at least in our headache clinics that come in. Um, but you also want to explain recurrence. The triptans don't turn off the headache generator that we think is in the trigeminal nucleus caudalis area. They will turn off um, the pain, the efferent loom of the pain. So I'm not going to talk about mechanism of action. If you have questions about that, I'll take them later. But recurrence, if someone has, like this lady did, a 24 to 36 hour headache or maybe a three day migraine, these drugs may have recurrence. That is, they wear off, their effect wears off in 12 to 24 hours. People might need another pill the next day. It doesn't mean it's failed in the headache. Backup therapy is usually an injectable if treatment fails. Um, and, and rescue therapy, if you feel that you can keep your patient from going to the emergency room even once a year with a three milligram dilaudid suppository, okay, if it's going to work. You have to feel comfortable with that. They have to feel comfortable with that. Um, I guess that's why I picked the suppository. I, I don't, I don't, I think that's a little bit harder to, you know, not use that one um, often. One of the things you need to ask when you're taking a history is about speed of headache onset. So how fast does it take you to go from zero to 60? If you look at most medications, and I'll, I'll use the triptans as an example, peak plasma concentration comes between one and two hours. So if somebody tells you that their headache reaches max of 30 minutes, you've already lost the game. Plus, um, the gut stops as the headache gets worse. Not just because, you know, the vagus is just firing on all cylinders, you've got nausea, you've got gastroparesis, but again, it, it's always a race between the drug getting where it's supposed to go in time and the headache getting a lot worse. So pick the injectable, which reaches peak plasma concentration in five to 10 minutes. The injectable is perfect as a drug of first choice if people wake up with a headache, if they have really bad nausea, and vomiting and or vomiting over time, uh, or again as a, as a backup. So can we ask questions as you go, or do you want to get in? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Two slides, but you don't have to go back. You said you need a backup therapy that's an injectable. If you initially give the patient a triptan, it doesn't work. Do you advise them? I mean, they already have a triptan in their system, so then injectable triptan two hours later, or? Yeah, if, if they've used the pill, it's a, good, it's a good question. I think it, it really depends what you start with. Um, I think that, let's say you do start with an oral trip down, and if that's not working, you certainly can repeat it in two hours. You can repeat the injectable in one hour. Um, if they used the trip down and it doesn't work, sometimes we'll just go to dihydrogonum, something like that. And I've got a slide on that a little bit later, too. But the timing is important, so you have to be aware of the half-life. Um, some of the things to consider that we've struggled with when we had, um, um, well, when we really had the ability to do infusion center work with our headache patients would be things like um, transportation, climbing. These are kind of no-brainers, no-brainers, excuse me. But you, you really have to establish a cutoff time for the patient to call. Most of us want the patient to avoid the emergency room. It's cruel and unusual punishment. It's, you know, they have to wait for all the heart attacks to go by. It's, as things are ramping up, they're vomiting. There's reasons that people are going to the ED, but um, if you can side vent that by giving them a list of the way you want them to self-treat, that would be great. Um, we also have the nursing staff at that time who, you know, were very comfortable with the headache medications, as most of the nursing staff in neurology is, for example. The one reason that you probably wouldn't want people to come in would be, you know, if they're telling you they've, they've been vomiting for three days, I would say there might be an electrolyte depletion. They may need um, infusion and rehydration by that time. Um, one of the things we don't do, we, we, have, we are forced now with Epic, which is a good thing, maybe, to look at their drugs. Uh, but. Sometimes we don't ask people, what did you take that day, right as they're taking the headache? Because a lot of people go through their medicine cabinet, and you really want to be aware of what they've already taken. That might make a difference also in what you uh, prescribe for an acute dose. And here, use rational polytherapy. So you have to respect the half-life of the medication. For example, sumatriptan, you can, it's pretty much out of your system, the half-life, T1, half, four to six hours. 
So I would feel really good getting DHE at that time, but not the opposite. So DHE is a 10 to 12 hour half-life drug. You really have to wait half a day um, or the rest of the day you know, before you use a trip down. Um, what we used as outpatient treatment protocols then is sort of a combination approach. And I'm going to show you data for this in just a second. Dopamine antagonist, if sedation isn't an issue, you can always put a patient on a cab and send them home. But the dopamine antagonists are very underused and wonderful medications. Um, if you want to get someone back to work, the 8 milligram ODT on Dancitron is pretty reasonable. Um, treatment with a migraine specific therapy, then either the Sumatriptan or DHE 45, and we usually add control at 60 milligrams IM to that as well. And the neuroleptics, why, why am I saying they're really underutilized? I think because a lot of us uh, feel that we're really using them for the nausea and the vomiting instead of to treat the migraine too. But if you look at some of the migraine data, it's actually pretty impressive. Um, the butyrophenones are probably the most, the, they work the best against migraine. At least Halbel does. Not that you want to give that for migraine for certain reasons, but when the uh, but because you also have to deal with EPS, so that's one of the reasons. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide. I got this from a very old copy of Goodman and Gilman, um, and it, it, it talks about um, really the tightness of binding, the affinity to the dopamine receptor, and how good a drug is for migraine. So this is independent of treating nausea, independent of treating vomiting. The tighter um, the D2 dopamine receptor antagonist binding, the better it is as a migraine drug. So you can see that Haldol, tightest binding, best drug, but which one of, you know, who, who wants to use Haldol? It's, uh, you know, again, the side effects may not be great, but most of us are fine using compazine. And so 10 milligrams of compazine, as many of you know, is just a great treatment on its own without anything. Um, droperidol I put down there below for opposing. Interestingly enough, um, flunarazine, which is a calcium channel blocker, I don't know if you recognize that, but it's, a, it's available in Canada uh, and they will honor our prescriptions. However, that's another aside. Flunarazine also binds at the dopamine receptor and uh, at the histamine receptor. It's a great underused calcium channel blocker. So um, these are the doses. They're for your reference. One of the things we have to worry about with these are uh, arrhythmias. And many of us in the um, headache age group that we treat, we don't necessarily do an EKG for everybody, although, you know, if you're doing clinical trials, I think a lot of us are used to looking at QT intervals. But if someone's on methadone, if someone's on cyzanidine or venlafaxine, spiridone, odantitron, you, you really probably should do an EKG if you're going to put people on some of these high dose uh, drugs like the. Uh, Chlorpromazine is clear, but propoparazine isn't compazine, so it should be. So, yeah. Um, I actually had never heard of Aldol having such an efficacy, and I understand why you wouldn't, you wouldn't use it normally, but in a situation of like status megadosis or where you're really not getting this benefit, would you use it before, say, admission for infusion? I, I probably use droperidol first. Droperidol? Yeah. 0. 0.65. 0. 0.65. Yeah, and uh, when we had uh, when we had the infusion center on Eight Southeast available to us, um, I think they were so so comfortable with Droperidol that we actually usually dispensed with EKG. But that was around the time the black box warning came out. Yeah. Um, this I, I made this slide from uh, three papers, three sequential papers that uh, Dr. Deborah Tepper and her colleague did in Headache about three years ago. And um, this is, these are some of the very common drugs you see used in the emergency department. And these are the patients, percent patients with pain relief uh, when using uh, one of these drugs. It's very difficult to get the emergency room to participate in certainly placebo-controlled trials. Um, but there are at least two randomized trials in this group, not, not necessarily placebo controlled. Again, because severe pain is really difficult to randomize people to placebo. However, pain relief is going from moderate to severe pain to mild or no pain. 
And you can see that droperidol, sumatriptan, prochlorperazine are really on the top three. Um, and then you have kind of a middle group with DHE and the Thorazine and Ketorolac and even, even Demerol, okay. And then Magnesium, Ketorolac and Valproate, um, Depakon are down here in the last um, third here. A um, couple of things to notice though, if you give a drug IV, like look up metoclopramide, you get much better efficacy there than with metoclopramide I am. If you raise the bar just a little bit, and you look at percent patients with pain freedom, going from moderate to severe pain to absolutely no pain within two hours, then you're going to see something a little bit different, but you're still looking at prochlorperazine and chlorpromazine being uh, the best drug. So how do you get around, how do you get around that? Um, obviously, uh, even the best drugs here you're getting 50% as far as pain freedom. And so what we really want to do then is combine drugs. We combine drugs with different mechanisms of action, different efficacies, to try to get something to give patients not only uh, pain freedom, but also decreased recurrence. Um, so since these studies have, haven't been done, a lot of what I'm saying here is really based on 20 years experience with treat, treating people in a clinic or an infusion set and seeing what's a good combination. Um, so the recommended combination based on uh, pain relief is going to be droperidol or compensating prochlorperazine, sumatriptan or DHE, and ketorolac or dexamethasone. Uh, based on pain freedom, it's pretty close, but I probably choose prochlorperazine first. Um, it's really hard to get IV chlorpromazine. <coughs> and then meperidine, sumatriptan, or magnesium are probably equivalent when you're looking at the, the pain free data. But it depends what you have available. If you only have your clinic available, or let's say you're going to give a patient a home, you know, so this stuff worked in the ED form. What if you want to give them the equivalent thing at home? You kind of can using <coughs> suppositories. So you can do a chlorpromazine suppository, 100 milligrams, will put people out for an MRI, no matter how agitated they are. But you don't want to go maybe that high. <laughs> but if you can get the suppositories, they work very fast. They've got really good um, and fast uh, absorption in a, in a, in a, a rectal <coughs> uh, dosing form. Um, and then the sumatriptan, subcutaneous. Magnesium, though, um, in my experience, really needs to be given IV to work. Oral magnesium has been used a lot, but you know, oral magnesium, it's really, it's a very difficult absorption problem, which is why we use, you know, make citrate and other things like that for pre-colonoscopy. So by the time you get enough of a level, it's kind of working against you in a way. Um, dexamethasone is interesting. Dexamethasone in any ED studies in which it was used did not have efficacy on its own for the headache, but it did seem to prevent recurrence, people coming back to the emergency room the next day for another course of treatment. So um, rather than doing like EO, prochlorperazine, you do rectal district muscular absorption? If, 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 somebody's, if somebody's at home. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if I can give it IV, I'll give it IV. Mm -hmm. But EO probably not so much unless they've had like there, a yeah, there, yeah. It's Yeah. It's not, it's not very well absorbed. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not. And, it's, and that's actually been looked at when you label these drugs and you give them, um, and you give them to people with bad gastroparesis. They're just not absorbed. Ah, oh, latecomers. <laughs> You've heard this. Yes. Can IV, can I be given IV push? Yes, well. So I know with hereditary angioedema, there are some drugs that patients can be taught to give themselves IV push. Have that's not been a consideration? No. You know, I think um, when people have headaches, I mean, there's a lot of things you have to consider. Can they read labels on things? Can they really get the, the proper dosing amount? Um, IV push for, are you talking about, you're talking about in clinic though, in outpatient clinic, right? Well, I'm thinking it could be done at home if you can have syringes made 
Oh, pre-filled. You know, pre-filled syringes. And, and, it, and, and if somebody seems cost, to so, find in their vein. But, they, well, but I mean, we've had patients with other disease states that can be taught to do that. So I'm just like thinking, yeah. could it be done? I, I think that uh, the trouble with some of these drugs is if you miss the vein, you could slough off an arm. I mean, it's not very good. It's, you know, they do have side effects. So I, I'm very hesitant about doing things like that. Sub Q, I am self injections, fine. But even that, you know, they have to be taught. Oh, yeah. They have to be carefully taught. I think Dr. Miranova is going to do a lecture on pharmacologia next year. Yeah. So I'm just going to buzz through this really fast then. Um, but again, chronic migraine is the uh, sleeper headache, so to speak. And uh, differential diagnosis, I think she's going to talk about more. We all, when we talk about excluding secondary headache and you know what would make you nervous about a secondary headache, chronic migraine, people have had migraine but transformed it to more than 15 days of headache a month. Hemicrania continua, I want to talk about a little bit. I think this is a very underdiagnosed, very important side block headache. New daily persistent headache is really a description of a headache that starts, you know, February 18th, 1989, and, and it never goes away. People remember the date, and if you haven't had a history of migraine before, and all of a sudden it starts, new daily persistent headache is a descriptor of basically latency, the time course of that. But it doesn't really tell you what kind of headache it is. It's not an entity, a causative entity in itself. It's a descriptor. And chronic tension type headaches I mentioned before. So um, I want to I want to talk about this case, which illustrates some of the points I was talking about. A little bit different from your first case. This is a 50 year old woman. She also had episodic headaches since 12, but over the last three years, a gradual increase in frequency of headache. That's also something you want to ask. If somebody goes from never even headaches to a lot of headaches, was it? If one day they woke up and they had them, or is it a gradual increase in, in frequency? The moderate headache was daily, and it was over and over that she had about 10 really severe headaches a month. Daily headaches, bitemporal, really characteristics of chronic tension type headache. But the intermittent headaches had the characteristics of migraine. They were severe, they were stabbing, uh, occasionally she had vomiting. She takes elitriptan, Relpax. Um, if it's effective most of the time, uses hydrocodone as a rescue. 20 days of Relpax a month, to hydrocodone 10 days a month. And she's tried preventatives, other preventatives in the past. And like a lot of people you might hear, they'll say, oh, it worked for a while, but then it didn't work, so I quit. And sometimes you don't have those, and sometimes you don't know how long or what dosing. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. It's, it, hopefully Epic will help us with that. Her past medical history included GERD, allergic rhinitis, a mild hyperlipidemia, fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression, and she was perimenopausal, so a lot of hits here. Good. Current medications, uh, topiramate in a decent dose, the Relpax and hydrocodone we talked about. She's also on sertraline, 200 milligrams, protonics, nasal steroids, and Allegra D on turmeric. Social history, she's an attorney, not a bad person, Minimal exercise, however, and lots of stress. And she had an MRI that was okay about four years ago. So Are you sure she wasn't a bad person? She was an attorney. Just, just, just. She didn't do malpractice. <laughs> okay. um, so so you, you, you're going to get the history and you're going to give her a diagnosis, right? So what is her diagnosis? And you're also going to keep in the back of the mind hot flashes, so she's got estrogen levels going up and down, social so response to preventatives, does that mean her pyramid's a failure, lots of medications, do we repeat the MRI, because it is a change in the headache. So her diagnosis is at least chronic migraine without aura, a history of episodic migraine without aura, possible medication to relieve headache. Why do I say possible? Because it really isn't the diagnosis until you take the medication away and the headache gets better. Um, and what's the role of medication she's already on? Well, medication overuse, as we said. Oops. But there's some interesting things about sertraline, Allegra D, and Premarin. Um, sertraline, any of the SSRIs, and it, it's a class effect. It's not necessarily dose-related, but you've got a 10% chance of headache right there. Um, 
Temperature's pretty high, even though in most package insert you will see headache as a <laughs> side effect of the medication. Usually the, the SSRIs will cause low-grade daily headaches, but sometimes with low-grade nausea. Um, when people say they're on Allegra or Claritin or whatever it is, always ask if they, the D is there. Because if they're on the decongestant one, then they're also taking a daily powerful sympathomimetic amine, which is a vasoconstrictor. I put that in the same category as people who drink like eight or ten cups of coffee a day. It is a drug, so you might want to take away the effects of that by changing to regular Allegra, Cisoproheptadine, something without a sympathomimetic amine. And Premarin, Premarin, independent of what the Humane Society says, you know, it's still a bad drug. Um, equine estrogens are so different than, uh, than, than human estrogen uh, characteristics in terms of their structure. And I think that uh, the estrogens we have are really similar to plant estrogens. So, so don't, it's not like, if they need to be on HRT, great, but you might want to try, if they have headaches, switching to estradiol, to estrase, to something that is not equine. Very different structure than ours. And also has been associated with an increase in headache. Um, migraine specific therapies are still, I don't think she's failed. You can't say she's failed her failed her acute therapy or her preventative therapy until you get the the possible medication overuse out. Question? Yeah. Um, if you determine an SSRI might be a cause of a headache and you want to change it. Can you use, it, it's, it, you said it's a drug class, but do you have success with other SSRIs or do you just need to get out of the class? If, if, you, if you really have a high suspicion that that could be it, then you gotta get out of the class. But for that, people are on, I mean, 200 milligrams of sertraline, there's an issue there. The depression is real. You, you don't say, let's hold this for a few days. I mean, tapering off an SSRI is hideous. And, you know, short of the half-life, the worse it is. So you really have to work with primary care or psychiatry to, um, to really decide what to do there. So, um, preventative, to prevent medication overuse headache um, by, if your patient isn't on it, by really giving them some feedback on how often is too often for a drug. And no matter what it is, you don't want to use it more than two to, two to three days a week on average. I mean, maybe the week of the menstrual period, you're going to use it every day for four or five days. That's fine if you go back to using it infrequently um, other times. Um, medication overuse headache. You need headache to begin with. You wake with early morning headache, usually with what you have wearing off the day before. The pattern of headaches is usually predictable and shows an escalating frequency, which is why it's so important to get this gradual increased story. Um, really, the only way to see if it's the issue is to take them off the drug. And um, I don't have time to talk about the different drugs. I think Dr. Miranova will. Um, oh, and Sierra, for example, you're not gonna, you're not gonna take someone off furanol or you know daily Vicodin or you know high doses of things that might have withdrawal associated with them. Whereas I don't feel bad about doing that with uh, cold turkey with Excedrin, for example. Um, so you taper the medication if there's something you have to worry about, for example, if it has a narcotic in it or a barbiturate. And substitute medications less likely to cause medication overuse. If someone is not on a preventative, unlike the lady that we just talked about, you might want to try a preventative. Or you might, or you might just want to see what it's like just taking them off the medication, taking her off the medication overuse headache. If, if they're using daily triptans, then maybe you'll want to use DHE. If they're using daily ibuprofen, naproxen is different enough that you could substitute that. Um, the short course of steroids sometimes is useful. Um, if they're not, if they're taking 20 Excedrin a day, you might want to give them a little Imitrex daily, 25 milligrams. TID was what the paper was published with, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, <coughs> Preventative therapies, um, again, please use these slides. I'm not going to go over them in detail, but please use them as references. The American Academy of Neurology and the Neurology and American Headache Society have really looked at how good the quality of research is before they put these into categories, A, B, C, uh, U for unknown. 
So more than two randomized controlled trials were done for zinc drugs, for tocolol, for pranolol, timolol, as far as the beta blockers. So Pyramate, Depakote, and Butterbur, yeah, it had two randomized controlled trials, but I think for many of us, it's not a great preventative, but it's certainly useful for people that say, I don't want to be on a drug. I want a natural product. Um, level B drugs, a lot of us use amitriptyline. Um, again, I'm going to run through these um, level C drugs, level U, insufficient data. The only thing I want to say about this is that um, verapamil is really a good drug for some headaches, like cluster headaches. Uh, probably not so good for migraine, but in a lot of people it will work, so it might be your, your, your third level drug. Endomethacin is good for drugs that are cluster cousins, like hemicrania continua, paroxysmal hemicrania. It's a wonderful drug if used in the proper dose. Um, I, I do use fluoxetine for headaches, and a typical person I might use fluoxetine is uh, somebody between 11 and 16 that has anxiety um, as part of a migraine complex. Same thing with Lamotrigine in teenagers. Uh, because it's an AED and it might not have as great data as Topamax or Debaco, but it certainly has fewer side effects um, of the type that you might not want to see in a teenager who's usually going to Lakeside and a little, you know, and, and wants to get in on a doctor's scholarship to university. Um, many of you are aware that you don't just inherit a migraine, you inherit, you don't just inherit migraine, you inherit a brain that supports migraine. And these people have higher odds ratios of these comorbid conditions. For example, anxiety is seen 5.4 times more often in people with migraine than without migraine. So you might want to use this. Not that you're treating both things, but if you've got a picture, if someone's coming out at you and you're getting a picture of someone who's slightly depressed, very anxious, has migraine, maybe, maybe you want to pick something that will change serotonin. So, um, Sleep issues, uh, you'll probably talk about this next year too, but chronic daily headache is really associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Many of our patients go to our sleep center, which does an amazing job for us. Use it as a tool. So how are you going to pick between amitriptyline, or topolop, or pranolol, to pyramate? If somebody has anxiety, well, maybe you want to choose a low dose. Um, SSRI or SNRI or Lamotrigine or Depakote or use biofeedback. So I haven't talked a lot about adding pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, but you know I do like the medications. I understand them. I'm a pharmacist too. Uh, but and the other thing is, if you find someone who's really good in doing non-pharmacologic treatment, they're worth their weight in gold. So make sure they pay you. <laughs> um, Depression, same thing, add pain psychology. We have wonderful pain psychologists in our rehab department. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, if they have insomnia, uh, choose drugs with sedating side effects that also may have some efficacy in headache. Mirtazapine, for example, is a, a serotonin type 2 antagonist, which, uh, which uh, has a positive efficacy in headache, as does tizanidine. Um, Raynaud's is not listed as a comorbid condition, and if anybody wants a quick and dirty uh, subject to look at and do a poster on, just look at, the, look at how many people you see with migraine who have Raynaud's. So I want to see that poster. Um, cluster headaches, let's see, I think I have a minute, no, five minutes. Um, Two things about differentiating cluster from migraine. What is the timing? A cluster headache is a short headache, 15 minutes to three hours. They're done. It's also a pacing headache. So you will find people hitting their head against the wall instead of going in a dark room and laying down. They can't stand to lay down. The autonomic symptoms, sure, you'll have it. You'll have autonomic symptoms in migraine too, so that's not always a good differentiator. Treatment of cluster, oxygen works great in about 80% of people. The one thing I want to point out about this is that over the last couple of years, um, we've kind of redefined the flow rate of oxygen. So in the, about five years ago, we were saying 
eight to 10 liters a minute, but now we're really cranking it up 10 to 12 liters a minute, and it works a lot better if you can, you know, like tie them down so they don't go flying across the room. Um, Short-term prevention, sometimes it's useful to give them a trip tent. They know they're gonna have a headache in the middle of the night, and usually if they get a cluster, it's gonna be one hour to two hours after going to sleep. And sometimes taking a trip tent at bedtime can work as a short-term preventative while you're getting your two preventatives with rapid induction in place. Always use an AED, always add a calcium child blocker. The combination works pretty well for most people. Um, corticosteroids, I, I, you know, the longer you're a neurologist, the more you find side effects of things you've done. So I, I've really tried to decrease my corticosteroid use, but of course with prednisone, sometimes it's very helpful. Ah, sex. Um, <laughs> These are the people that will always come in to see you because they're so frightened. So um, the, the, the sex headaches are really uh, interesting in that. We still don't know what causes them, but it's, it's not women over men. It's equal. It's a later headache, late 20s, 30s, 40s. This is the headache that you always want to get an MRI with um, because there is a small chance that it could be associated with a sentinel bleed. But um, it occurs at orgasm. It's like somebody taking a baseball bat and hitting you on the back of the head. And, nobody, and it, you don't have to have a history of migraine before that. So very unusual headaches, self-limiting. But because you don't know how long it's going to last, it does respond to a calcium channel blocker in pretreatment with um, um, so a high-dose um, high dose NSAID. Usually I use endomethacin for that, like 50 to 75 milligrams. Hemicrania continua, you will see it. Um, in the 70s, um, we were missing case reports, 20, 26 cases. But you know, as, as the years have gone by, I think you will probably see several of these cases um, in, within two or three years. This is a continuous side lock headache. It's always side lock, and it waxes and wanes in intensity. Um, there is autonomic features to it, but um, endomethacin is also part of the definition. It has to respond to endomethacin. And uh, the hard thing about endomethacin is that, is that not everybody likes endomethacin. It, it does cause some side effects, you know, GI stuff. Um, however, uh, you have much, you have fewer GI symptoms if you use sustained release. So endomethacin, 75 milligrams every 12 hours. It's just as good as 50 milligrams every eight hours, fewer side effects. And actually, a steady state is reached probably within two to three days in, in both. Uh, endomethacin is going to work in 48 to 72 hours. So really, for the test, you just need to, it's both a diagnostic and therapeutic uh, drug. You all need to know how to do occipital nerve blocks. <clears throat> There's no difference between your finger on the occipital artery and an ultrasound, um, unless their blood pressure is like 70 over 50. <laughs> so um, it's really easy. It's a bedside procedure. It takes five minutes. Uh, if you want to know how to do it, I'll be happy to show you. But I think this is very, very helpful, not only in occipital neuralgia, the classic that you know where somebody shoveling slip mode slips backwards and hits the back of their head, or you get whiplash in a car accident. Uh, but it has, there's a lot of papers out showing that it is efficacious even for cluster headaches. It's a simple procedure. You just drop euthobicane, um, marcaine, maybe put in some depomedrol. And why does it work? We don't really know, but um, I think you're probably decreasing afferent input, again, into the trigeminal nucleus caudalis area. So it, it, it works very well. Um, I'm sure you will have somebody really wanting to show you how to use Botox, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> uh, behavioral therapy, I don't have time to talk about, but again, I think giving your patient a plan, the pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic therapy, is really the way to go. Remembering that you can lead a horse to water, but you might as, you know, you can't always make them drink. Drink more water, drink less alcohol. <laughs> The resources, National Headache Foundation, American Headache Society, they're not only resources for you, they're wonderful printouts for your patients. So add that to the education list. 
The most important tool that you can have that you can give your patient is a headache diary. There's about, last I saw, 22 apps and smartphones for it. Um, we have one we printed out with UWs. I mean, I had to go through forms, so it took us like a year, right? But, um, but it's very, very helpful because people don't remember things very well, right? So um, you can see if what you did the visit before has had an effect. Therapies and development, I don't have time to talk about. I don't think the neuromodulation is anywhere near where we can really talk about it um, in, co in common use. But the CGRP antagonists, of which we have some clinical trials going on right now, are probably going to be the next big find in migraine. Um, I think I said that when I gave this talk maybe two or three years ago. But at that time, we were using small molecules. Now, we've upped the ante to monoclonal antibodies, which are very interesting because guess what? <laughs> I know, they'll make a ton of money. We're doing Am Amgen, Lilly, Teva. They've all got them going. But it's interesting. The targets are a little bit different. You can target CGRP, calcitonin G-related peptide, or you can target the receptor. But if this works, the monoclonal antibodies will need to be dosed maybe once or twice a month. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Thank you. And I take questions. Um, what are your thoughts on the cephaline? <laughs> I should let Natalia answer that. Um, I, I don't use the cephaline because I think the data is um, not great and the insurance companies won't cover it. So I have trouble, even if people don't respond to things, I have trouble telling people to go spend you know, $250. Um, so no, none of the insurance is covered? No, it's, uh, it's out of pocket. So my, my opinion, again, we've used it a lot, and my opinion is medications are very expensive. So what some people pay out of pocket for medications, people pay for cephalin within a month. So, you know, again, you know, Have you had a good response? We had excellent response in that point, yeah. But and I think that's it's they use it every day? If you use it every day for 20 minutes. So, uh, but I, it might be patient selection too. Yeah, that's true. Hi, so, um, can you just comment? I know in this rope world, we're hesitant on the triptans and the ergots and others as well. How your approach to management of acute headache in a patient with a vascular history? Oh, that's another lecture which I have, but <laughs> I won't give it. Um, it's a good question, and I think if you're concerned about vasoconstriction, so anybody that has atherosclerotic through vascular disease or coronary artery disease, I mean, it's probably, you know, coronary disease, probably cerebral vascular disease, but you're not going to use them anyway because um, because they'll vasoconstrict. So it kind of depends on the, on, the, on the etiology. If someone has a stroke from something else that, that that doesn't cause arterial narrowing, then fine. You know, I, don't, I don't worry about that too much. However, um, the research that's been done on looking with transcranial Dopplers and other things on whether drugs like Spumatriptan, even given IV, which you don't use clinically, what, how much they vasoconstrict through the cerebrovascular system, they don't do anything to the vascular arteries anything to the carotid. So, you know, but you find it in a package instant, so a lot of us are taking a step back and being, you know, very careful about it. Yeah. Um, they also gave it IV to people who were getting uh, coronary angiograms, too. And it did basically constrict. I mean, mostly, uh, mostly you're going to find serotonin type 2 receptors in the heart for basic constriction. And the Demetrix still has a little bit of 5-HT2 uh, binding. So, you know, you're going to be really careful there. But at the most, even giving that ID again, like they're on the table, they basically constricted about 14% at the most, 10 to 14%. And uh, it's funny, it's mostly sick arteries and bleeds. It was the healthy ones that did. So, with sick arteries, there's something going on with the receptor. Yeah. You alluded to uh, a difference between um, brand name and generic interest. Is that something that's real and should affect uh, the prescribing? Well, I, I'll take those as two different questions. 
I mean, I would like to be able to give brand drugs to people, but the insurance companies are not going to cover it. And whether it's worth it to the patient to pay a whole lot extra, like, you know, I mean, I'm not talking $80 for a, a tier three drug. We're talking, we're not going to cover it. It's going to cost you $642 a month. So it might not be worth it. So because generics only have to be 20% 20, 20 below to 20% above the amount of workable drug, and the FDA allows that, there's, you're probably dealing with a little less. I don't think that's so much of an issue because you can get around that by raising the drug, okay, raising the amount of the drug. But your excipients, your fillers, your um, dispersing agents, all the other stuff is, you know, they're not going to use high quality drugs. And in fact, uh, Teva made a, made Maxol. Maxol, you know, you'll find six, you'll find six generic drugs. Teva made one, for example, that would fall apart in my hand. So, so it doesn't mean the generics aren't going to work, but I do think there's a, a huge and variable quality in the generics you'll find of these drugs. And they're probably not as efficacious, kind of again, slower in onset. It doesn't mean they don't work. No. And uh, also, I've talked to Primera uh, about this too. If a patient finds a generic that works for them, like Dr. Reddy, is a pretty high quality generic company, then uh, that pharmacy is obligated to buy for that patient the drug that works. So unless they change that rule, uh, it's, it's, the patient should write down what the generic is and be on the bottle. Sylvia, there's some questions on the board oh, there. Thank you. Um, in children, we tend to emphasize sleep hygiene, aerobic exercises, not skipping breakfast and good hydration. Do you also make these suggestions for adults? Um, you know, I, that, I put that under, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. That's part of the trigger preventatives, looking at things people do with their lifestyles, and you wish that they could change them. So sure, I would like people to get seven to eight hours of sleep. Most of us get six. Um, for migraineurs, it's very important not to let that blood sugar fall, sometimes five little meals a day, but you know, they're still, they still might skip. Um, good hydration, yes. Very important. So we make these suggestions as part of controlling uh, triggers too. Um, what about pregnancy and breastfeeding? Oh, yes. That's a, that's a quick, simple answer. Um, I can give you a lot of references for that, but um, using migraine darts in pregnancy is completely different than using them in breastfeeding. And I'll answer the breastfeeding one first because it's the easiest. If you're looking at a drug um, to be used in breastfeeding moms, and you're really not sure what the American um, Society of Pediatrics has said, then look at its protein binding. Chances are if it's a high protein binding drug, it stays in mom's plasma and it doesn't get secreted into breast milk. So for example, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, into medicine, 99% protein bound. So chances are it's, it's fine. Um, the trip can, of course, very important in terms of treating headache. And you're going to find that it's contraindicated in the package insert. However, there are enough um, human studies to show that, for example, Imitrex is, is very poorly um, secreted into breast milk. And Imitrex also has a terrible bioavailability. So not only is there a small amount, so you'll probably get 0.4% of the dose in, in, in four hours. And nobody, I hope I tell it's the best week for four hours. It sounds like torture. But you know, you, so you're gonna, so you're gonna look at, you're gonna look at that sort of thing. Look at the protein binding. Not always. There's something called milk trapping. Um, some drugs like zonisamide are milk trapped. Five times the amount in breast milk is in. Uh, as in plasma, mom's plasma concentration. So um, be good to look up, but as a, as a guideline, most things that are highly protein bound are okay. Um, pregnancy, very different, um, but um, the Norwegian mother and child cohort, which looked at over 60,000 women, um, I think it was in 2012, um, found that a lot of people took sumatriptan. 
maybe 2% of their population, which turned out to be probably over 5,000 people. But it's not a great, you know, it's not great because they also took other things. So these are not clinical trials, they're just long-term observations. But um, that and the uh, registry for Emetrex and Maxalt and uh, uh, Emerge, which were the largest registries, really didn't show any signal there for um, problems with uh, the child. So I, I regularly recommend, I'd rather have someone take um, a trip down during pregnancy and breastfeeding rather than use something else like Excedrin or narcotics. Um, and uh, Fiorinol, which OBGYNs used to prescribe a lot, uh, the short-term barbiturates are really bad for fetal livers, so don't do that either. And then uh, NSAIDs. NSAIDs are fine except in the very beginning and the very end of pregnancy. Um, in the very beginning, uh, they've shown that the NSAIDs will, uh, will prevent um, implantation of the blastocyst. So if someone's having trouble getting pregnant and taking a lot of NSAID, that might be an issue. At the very end, you're worried about um, patent ductus arteriosus. So you don't take it the last trimester if you can, certainly the last month. Sylvia, um, John asked you about uh, taking these uh, uh, migraine abortants uh, if you have a history of stroke or you've had a heart attack. Um, we know that package inserts say all kinds of things. They used to say you couldn't take carbidopa, levodopa if you had any history related to melanoma. When it was studied, it was found to be completely preposterous that there was no effect whatsoever. So there are thousands, tens of thousands of adults in the age where they're having heart attacks, stroke, etc. Surely someone has studied whether there's an increased frequency in stroke or heart attack in these populations, yes? That's a, that's a hard question to answer because even with the CGRP antagonists, which don't cause vasoconstriction at all, if someone had risk factors for vascular disease or had had a stroke or heart attack, they couldn't be in the trial. So, so, it, it, so what you're looking at is like a, a registry, and nobody, nobody's doing that for the registry. So that's, It seems to me a pretty important question. Uh, you know, if you're over the age of 60, your risk goes up something like uh, 7,000 times for having a heart attack or a stroke compared to when you're 20, right? I mean, there's a huge age effect. So just by putting a bunch of people at a particular age into a registry who are taking or not taking one of these drugs, quickly enough you'd have some data. Yeah, and when you look at that, I mean, there's, there's, there's especially when Imitrex came out and, and nobody really knew, you know, they looked at people, they gave free drug to people, they said, use it, use it any way you want, as long as you want, and I, th I think one person gave himself an injection every single day, and really there wasn't an increased signal, but, but in order to get that off a package insert, that would take a very expensive trial, and so I think that's why nobody's really doing it. So we have our clinical experience and we have what I'd say good anecdotal evidence, and we have, and we have the uh, the TCEs too. Yeah, you, the only thing is that there's been an appreciation over in the last ten years about the RCVS syndrome and all the different drugs that have been associated with it. Some of with the triptans that have come up in that list occasionally. It just it's enough to make you wonder. And a lot of the it seems from my clinical experience that. It's not usually the you know sixty and up plus with atherosclerosis. It's more like the cryptogenic strokes, men or women in their forties and fifties, or, or you know, or even earlier. Those are the ones that are really problematic and have serious headache issues. Where I feel like it's it's a real limitation. Well, I I don't you know personally. Um, if you've had an embolic stroke. I, I can't see where vaso, a vasoconstrictor is going to be an issue. The other thing you have to think about is that these drugs don't penetrate the brain. I mean, you have, you have to wait forever for the zone of your Imitrex to get into the brain. It's very long, very slow, very little. So, you know, what are you really doing? And we think the mechanism of action is dural trigeminal 
for general vascular system so you're dealing with those so you're not even you're not even in that space yeah the cryptogenic stroke is really interesting we didn't have, we didn't talk about the pfo thing but you know how, how long did we work on that study about four years it was four years to get enough people in that trial and it came out negative again so you know closing the pfo is not going to make your head better even though you know we have anecdotal studies that show the minute you closed a huge hole headaches went away so it's so it's a it's a great question i think it should be answered but i i whenever there's a medical legal issue involved you know i, I hesitate to tell people you should do this because you know if it's there in black and white a lot of people don't want to take those risks well, it's there on a list of things that can possibly happen. It's not necessarily a black, I don't suppose this is, a, is it a black box one? Yeah. It is yeah. a black box one. Yeah. If you have had a history of um, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, or, and that's the way they get around that, yeah. risk factors for them. So it would be really interesting to look into their data. I mean, I'm just wondering if there is any. There is. Or you there don't is, think that there's any. That, that came out in the beginning. Um, when they were writing the package insert. So you're looking at data from the late 80s to the early 90s. Um, so but when you're doing these safety trials afterwards, there wasn't a signal. But there was one lady in Kansas, I think this was 1994, end of 93 or early 94, who had a, a stroke after, after she got an injection of, a heart attack, after she got an injection of Sinotrypan. On the other hand, she was very overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, so a lot of risk factors there. And that, that so dear doctor letters came out saying you shouldn't use this in this setting, that kind of thing. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Morris, Morris is gonna comment on this, but I wanna introduce Dr. Mazels, who is one of the best headache doctors I have ever met, and he's just moved back to the Pacific Northwest after being gone since medical school in a, you know, like a hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, they, they said I could come back after 40 years. <laughs> so, we no, I was just going to comment, you know, we've got really good data about the risk of NSAIDs and cardiac events and cerebrovascular events. And we've got 16,000 people a year dying from NSAIDs. And every NSAID, I think with the exception of naproxen, doubles or triples the risk of a cardiac or CNS event. So, yeah, I think the triptans are a medical legal issue rather than a medical issue, but the NSAIDs are clearly an issue. We don't know how long you have to take an NSAID for, what the dose is, but we, the population thinks of NSAIDs as very innocent, but they're not. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Show my age. I recall way, way, way back when I was a resident, before any of these vasoconstricting agents were available, what we were taught was there is a low but significant background incidence of stroke in migraine. Is that still considered to be a fact? Yes. Uh, however, it's not, it's not with migraine with, without aura. It's with migraine with aura. And the, and, the, and, the, and the numbers are very, very small, very, very small. And that's only between looking at um, women under, four, well, people under 45. Okay. So it, but the, the risk is so small, it pales in significance besides hypertension or people on oral contraceptives or smokers. So um, in, in England, for example, uh, they will not give trip chance to women that have migraine with aura. In the United States, we do. I don't think we're more cavalier about it, but we, we will follow them. And if, if they increase their aura, if they prolonged aura, then you know, we'll think about it again. Sophie, that was great. We oh. can keep you here probably until tomorrow, but thank you. Thank you.